In this video, I'm going to tell you how I think about nitrates and phosphates in my Acropora dominated tanks. First, let's get the basics out of the way. Simply put, corals need nitrogen and phosphorus. There are a bunch of nitrogen and phosphorus containing compounds that animals need to live, grow, and reproduce. Corals fulfill a lot of their nitrogen and phosphorus requirements from nitrates and phosphates, which we obviously test for as aquarists. Corals receive their nutritional requirements through different mechanisms, and the purpose of this diagram was to illustrate them. But as I read and learned more, I realized that a few of these details are incorrect or oversimplified. But no problem, the most important takeaways here are that corals are well suited to take in nitrogen and phosphorus sources with the help of their symbiotic zooxanthellae, as well as with the help from microorganisms like bacteria, viruses, fungi, and archaea. All three symbionts are great at recycling nitrogen and phosphorus compounds between one another when needed, and this is the reason why corals can do well in low nutrient conditions in the wild. Speaking of wild conditions, nitrates on a natural coral reef can range from about 0.5 to about 2.5 ppm. As for phosphates, they measure somewhere around 0.01 to 0.13 ppm. These numbers vary depending on the source, and there are seasonal and geographic variations as well. Over a decade ago, many reefers were trying to get their nutrient levels close to zero. And looking back, it was sort of understandable because there was some scientific reasoning behind it and nobody could deny the beauty of the ultra-low nutrient tanks that were popular back then. Now that we have a better understanding of the relationship between nitrates and phosphates to coral health, a lot of reefers nowadays are experimenting with higher nutrient levels in hope of achieving better growth and color. I haven't quite hopped on this wagon yet, in fact in the last couple of years when I measured my nutrients with our hobby grade test kits, they came back at zero. Although many reefers these days would denounce my low nutrient levels, I don't feel the need to change because I know that my corals are far from being nutrient deficient, just based on how they look. This brings me to my next point. If your test kits give you zero, but your corals look and grow great, then there's nothing to worry about. To put it in another way, the way your corals look is more reliable than what these test kits say. I felt the need to say this because I keep hearing of people who are freaking out about their so-called zero nutrients. And the reason they're freaking out is because the dominant narrative these days is that zero nitrates and zero phosphates are bad. But it seems to be taken out of context. The best way to say it is that zero nutrients are only bad if your nutrient import is inadequate. And at low nutrient test results, trust what your eyes tell you over the test kit. You also need to consider that our test kits are junk. About two years ago, at a time when I was measuring zero nitrate and phosphate, I sent in my water for an ICP test, and it showed my nitrate at 14 ppm and my phosphate at 0.03 ppm. Now, they don't specifically use the ICP OES method for these compounds like nitrate and phosphate, but whatever method they used, the result was significantly different than mine, and this reinforced my skepticism of our test kits. I trust their results over mine, and I bet the majority of folks who test zero aren't really at zero. How much nutrients your corals get is not as simple as a test result. Let me illustrate my theory. Pretend that this bucket here represents the aquarium. I can add in nutrients in the form of fish food at the top. The amount of liquid in the bucket at any given time represents the amount of nutrients in the tank. This spigot here represents the export of nutrients that the corals and beneficial algae need to live and grow. This spigot here represents artificial nutrient export methods like the skimmer, chemical media, and so forth. I drew this spigot huge because I run pretty aggressive export. So what happens is that corals are constantly using up nutrients to live and grow, and the nutrient export methods are constantly removing them as well. And if there isn't a constant supply of nutrients, their level will eventually drop too low. The important point with this model is that because there is a constant flux of nutrients in and out of the system, the measured nutrient levels doesn't necessarily reflect the amount of nutrients that the corals are getting because they could be taking it up soon after it's available. In my situation, because I'm all about heavy import and export, there is a steady supply of nutrients which prevents them from bottoming out. And the more food that I add, the higher I can get this nutrient level but only up to a certain point because my export is pretty aggressive, so it will take a lot of nutrient import to get it above this level. This here is essentially the range at which I can play with nutrient availability to see what gives me the best color and growth. I can move up or down this range by feeding more or feeding less. For now, I'm okay with this restricted range because I don't believe there is a difference or benefit in having nutrients at this level compared to somewhere up here. 
The benefits of this method are that I will probably never get near the point where I get nuisance algae and I will never get to the point where I brown out or kill corals, which really is not an issue in established tanks. But the point here is that I don't have to worry about the nutrients getting too high. And as long as I'm feeding the fish regularly, I'll never bottom out. The downsides with this method are that it's hard for me to experiment above this level and, as I mentioned earlier, I will bottom out quicker if for some reason the nutrient import stops or I don't feed enough. The normal nutrient import export model looks something like this where essentially the difference is the size of the nutrient output spigot. Here since it's smaller it's going to take longer to bottom out. Also it will take less nutrient import to get your levels up which allows you to experiment. But that comes with the added minor risk of getting too high if you don't keep an eye on your nutrient levels. So I'm not saying that one is better than the other but I think the heavy export import model is a little bit easier to keep stable and it fits my reefing style. The thing that I like most about it is I don't need to test anymore which is perfect because I don't trust those test kits anyway. Now I realize that there are a lot of reefers reporting better growth and or colors with higher measure nutrient levels. But for now I'm not going to experiment with that because I'm happy with my colors and I can't complain about my growth. Although I do sometimes wonder if I would get better growth if I took the roll foss offline to let my phosphates creep up a little bit. But more on that later. I frequently hear and read of people complaining about light colored, fading, or bleaching Acropora in new tanks. It's really not that surprising if we look at what's happening. For new tanks, the spigot that represents natural export methods is much smaller because there are not a lot of corals in the tank and the biological filtration is not established. I'm drawing the artificial nutrient export relatively large because even just a protein skimmer will probably account for the large majority of nutrient export. The other difference is that in new tanks, the spigot representing nuisance algae, cyano and dinoflagellates, etc., it's a real threat and it's much lower, again because there isn't strong biological filtration and the surface area of the rocks and glass are pretty much fair game. And if you gave them the right conditions, these opportunistic organisms will take over. So essentially, in new tanks, you are forced to walk this fine line of not having too many excess nutrients where bad stuff takes over, but you need to have enough to where you're not starving the corals. And unfortunately, you have to walk this fine line until your tank is established. Something that I experienced several times in the past is that adding macroalgae to the system helps tremendously with new tanks. I tried to conceptualize that observation using this model, and here's what I came up with. Adding macroalgae increases the size of this spigot while decreasing the relative contribution of this spigot, allowing you to feed more, preventing your corals from starving. Macroalgae also essentially adds a natural automated gate valve on this spigot, opening wider when there are more nutrients available, which corresponds to faster macroalgae growth, and closing or growing slower when there are less available nutrients. The other benefit of macroalgae like Catomorpha is that you get the beneficial hitchhikers like bacteria and other single celled organisms, pods, filter feeders, and so forth that comes on the surface of it. And when these spread to your rocks, my theory is that you are essentially speeding up the maturation process of your tank, hence moving this nuisance algae spigot up faster. I should also note that an algae turf scrubber also acts as an adjustable spigot, however it does not come with the added benefit of beneficial hitchhikers. But there is a huge unknown in tanks that is very important to keep in mind. It's the fact that new tanks are new tanks, period. It's quite likely that your corals are doing well because your tank isn't established regardless of what your nutrients are. Just to give you some perspective, my frag tank was started with all fresh rock. I didn't seed it with anything. I was killing some acros in here until about the 4 month mark. And even though I got acros to live after that, they really didn't start doing well until about the 1 year mark. There have been several scientific studies looking at the effect of elevated nutrients, and when you merge all these studies together as Chance and Burkpile did, the conclusion is that elevated nutrients from fish poop resulted in higher calcification rates than adding both nutrients. In other words, feeding more and getting more fish is better than dosing nitrates or dosing nitrates and phosphates together. But when adding phosphate alone, without nitrate, experiments showed increased growth. The possible problem is that there are also some studies showing decreased growth with elevated phosphate in other species, although the experiments were designed differently. So the bottom line may be that, while you may notice better growth in your tank with elevated phosphate, there is a possibility that some corals will slow down in growth. 
Also, I should point out that a study that showed increased growth from elevated phosphate also showed that corals exposed to elevated phosphate had a more brittle skeleton. Whether or not we as hobbyists would notice this, I don't know. As for adding nitrates, it's pretty well accepted that with increased nitrates comes increased density of zooxanthellae which results in darker colors. This is also a double-edged sword because there are some corals that will look better on the lighter side and some that will look better with more zooxanthellae. The last thing that I want to say about elevated nitrates is that if you're going to have higher nitrates, you should probably have some phosphate to go along with that. High nitrate with very low phosphate has been shown to increase susceptibility of corals to light and heat stress. I'm not going to get into nitrogen and phosphate ratios, but to put it simply, high nitrate with very low phosphate doesn't sound like a good idea. Science is great, don't get me wrong, but scientists evaluate health and growth where we as aquarists are equally, if not more, interested on the effect of nutrients on color. So us hobbyists need to figure that out ourselves. The only real recommendation I can provide is the only method I have experienced with. I can't comment on running higher nutrients because I've simply never done it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, just like how there's nothing wrong with how I run my tank. So, as I said earlier, I'm all about heavy input and output. My heavy input comes in the form of feeding the fish heavy. Currently in my 120, I put in two round teaspoons of pellets and two heaping teaspoons of flakes daily. This may not seem like a lot of food, but those pellets are hardy and it usually takes over 15 minutes for all the food to be gone. My bio load consists of about 15 fish, 15 snails, and a couple of hermit crabs, and of course the filter feeders on my rocks. I need to also say that I have a good amount of natural live rock for strong biological filtration. As far as nutrient export, I run a filter sock that I change when it gets clogged, usually about once a week. I run an appropriate size protein skimmer 24-7. I run a bit of row of foss, but I'm not very exact with how much I use. By the way, I tried generic GFOs in the distant past and I didn't like them and that's why I use Rofos specifically. But basically, I fill this small phosphate reactor about a third of the way full and the flow going through the reactor is just enough to make the top layer of Rofos tumble. If you look at the output of the reactor, you would conclude that I don't run it aggressively. Before I used to test phosphate to let me know when I need to change it out. But since I don't trust those test kits anymore, I usually just switch out the roll foss every 4-6 to six weeks. I also run a bucket refugium on reverse photo period. It grows cater well and I usually have to trim it about once every 7 days. I do about 15% water changes bi-weekly and for every water change I siphon out as much detritus as possible from the display. When detritus accumulates in the sump, I will try to clean it out, which is about twice a year. Despite what most may regard as aggressive export and the fact that I measure zero nutrients on my test kits, I still get that green haze of algae on the glass about every one to two days. So I happen to stumble upon someone else that seems to share my methodology. On Reef to Reef there was this grow out competition of this sniper blue acro where everyone started off with a 1 inch frag of this piece and the winner was the person with the biggest colony after one year of growth. I stopped counting but there must have been over 100 participants. I'll leave a link to that thread in the description below if you want to check it out for yourself. So the contest was completed this past October and let me show you the pictures of the winner. Again this is one year growth from a 1 inch frag. The winner in a later post talks about her feeding regimen and it sounds like she feeds a lot more than me. Here are her nitrate and phosphate levels. These numbers are so low that they can be easily be read as zero depending on what test kit is used. I PM'd her for more information and, in addition to the filter sock and the religious weekly water changes, Megan runs GFO and macroalgae. The point is, is that Megan appears to be on this heavy in and heavy out approach and she happened to win this competition among hundreds of entries. Obviously this is not a scientific study and nutrients are only one component of the successful reefing equation, but I wanted to share a different approach because I don't think many understand that adequate nutrients is more than just a test result. But with that said, there are many ways to be successful in this hobby and you could easily find many beautiful reef tanks out there taking a totally different approach. It's definitely an interesting time in reefing and looking back to when I first started in 1999, the reefing hobby has been constantly evolving ever since. I wonder what we'll be doing 10 years from now. Well alright, that's going to do it for this one. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I look forward to reading all of the different views on this topic. I know this was a long video, so thanks so much for making it this far. Until next time, 